Imagine a creature that looked part rhino, part hippo, and part something we can't quite compare to anything alive today. It wasn't a dinosaur, it wasn't a reptile, and yet it's, it's directly connected to us. How could such a bizarre design exist millions of years before mammals ever walked the Earth? The answer lies in one of Earth's strangest evolutionary experiments, a creature named Estaminosuchus. And in this video, we'll uncover five key pieces to its story, from the mystery of its body design to the reason it vanished in catastrophe. Imagine a skull so strange that even experienced paleontologists argued over it. When fossils were first pulled from the rocks of the central Russia's Perm region in the mid 20th century, no one was quite sure what they were looking at. It was a head more than half a meter long, bristling with horn-like projections and thick bony bosses jutting from unexpected places. To eyes trained on neat categories, reptile mammal or later dinosaur, this odd giant seemed to belong to none of them. Its bulky body fragments didn't help, either hinting at a creature as tall as a person's chest and weighing more than a ton. At first glance, you might think of a crocodile or maybe some prehistoric cousin of a rhinoceros. The truth, however, turned out to be something far stranger. The fossils came from the Ejevo locality near the town of Okyo, an area packed with mid-Permian bones. Soviet scientists were struck by how robust and eccentric these skulls were compared to other specimens from the same layers. Some had thick, upward pointing projections above the eyes, while others showed broad outgrowths along the cheeks. The arrangement was so inconsistent that paleontologists even debated if they were looking at more than one species. Eventually, Two forms were recognized as Estaminosuchus urulensis, the larger, with horns that angled outwards, and Estaminosuchus mirabilis, with additional bony spikes along the top of the skull that gave it a vaguely antler-like appearance. But the exact number of species has remained contested, with some researchers considering several early names to simply refer back to E. urulensis. At the time of discovery, scientists naturally reached for familiar categories. The massive head and squat frame suggested a crocodilian form, and so the fossils were catalogued under the name Estaminosuchus, meaning crowned crocodile. It was an easy label, but also a misleading one. This creature was no crocodile at all, nor did it sit alongside the dinosaurs which wouldn't appear for tens of millions of years. Instead, its true identity lay with the Eumtherapsids, a peculiar order of animals that descended from earlier synapsids. Unlike reptiles, synapsids carried a single temporal opening in the skull, a trait passed down into mammals today. This subtle feature revealed that Estaminosuchus, despite its reptile-like bulk, was actually a distant relative of ours. That realization was groundbreaking. Until then, the earliest stages of mammal ancestry seemed shadowy and reptilian, not full of horned, barrel-bodied swamp giants. Estaminosuchus gave scientists a vivid example that the line toward mammals included not only small, furtive insect eaters, but also enormous, odd-looking experiments. Its discovery sharpened the picture of how diverse theripsids were in the Permian and hinted that mammal-like traits had begun appearing in large animals long before mammals themselves took shape. By finding these connections, paleontologists could begin to trace how features like complex teeth specialized skulls and flexible skin structures were gradually assembled in our lineage. Still, the initial confusion wasn't misplaced. The horns and bony bosses of Estaminosuchus defied simple explanation. No living mammal has bone spikes like these, and reptiles with horns usually wield them for defense. To encounter such structures in an early synapsid threw expectations into chaos. Yet it confirmed something important. Evolution had already begun to combine characteristics in unusual ways. Testing designs that blurred neat categories. Estaminosuchus wasn't an alien fluke, but an early chapter in the story of mammals. One that looked outwardly monstrous while being family all along. And to really appreciate what made it so unnerving to meet face to face, we have to look more closely at the body it carried beneath that crowded skull. What kind of animal wears a crown made of bone, yet has skin that feels more like ours than a lizard's? Estaminosuchus was built around that contradiction, a creature with the mass of a rhinoceros and the skin texture of something oddly mammal-like. Its body was massive, padded with a barrel-shaped torso that could support over a ton of weight, and its limbs carried the strange blend of ancient and forward-looking traits that define the therapsids. 
The hind legs stood almost directly beneath the hips, an efficient posture for dragging such bulk across a swampy plain, but the forelimbs remained sprawled out to the side as if frozen halfway between lizard and mammal. From a distance, it must have looked like no animal you'd expect to see lurching out of Permian wetlands. The most extraordinary element of its design, though, sat at the front. Its head was a fortress of bone, crowded with projections, knobs and horns. These were not delicate antlers made of keratin like in deer today, but solid extensions of skull bone itself. The upward points rising from the frontals gave the appearance of truncated antlers, while thick bosses along the cheeks flared outward, making the skull appear almost wider than it was long. They weren't arranged in any symmetrical or familiar way, which may explain early confusion about what kind of creature it even was. Some horns swept outward, others stood erect, while cheek plates jutted to the side like shields. If you picture two bulls facing off, lowering their heads to test one another's strength, it isn't hard to imagine these projecting bones locking in combat, or at least serving as visual signals that this was not an opponent worth crossing. This crown likely mattered most to its own species. The elaborate bony structures may have helped individuals recognize members of their kind amid the crowded swamps, or they could have operated like natural advertisements of health and status warning rivals and attracting mates. Unlike predators which needed streamlined heads for biting or simple plant eaters that required wide jaws for chewing, Estomenosuchus carried display features that could have added as much burden as benefit. That tells us such ornamentation must have been worth the cost, playing a role bigger than mere accident. Even stranger was what paleontologists eventually discovered about its skin. In 1968, fossil impressions were described as smooth, scaleless, and even glandular, resembling the skin of a hairless mammal or a frog more than any reptile. At first glance, you would expect a Permian giant to wear a suit of tough scales like a crocodile. Instead, it carried a bare surface that might have allowed sweat-like cooling or moisture release. In a hot swamp environment, such gland-rich skin could have been vital for regulating temperature, especially when combined with its massive bulk where heat would accumulate. This adaptation looked far more like something from the mammal lineage than from reptiles. For scientists, finding it attached to a creature that still lumbered on partly sprawled forelimbs was a startling reminder of how early the mammal blueprint was being tested. When you put all these pieces together, the crown of spikes, the half upright legs and the smooth surface, it becomes clear that Estomenosuchus stood at the crossroads of design. Its outline whispered reptile, but its details signaled mammal. Evolution was experimenting in full view, producing an animal that blurred categories and defied expectations. It was neither fully primitive nor recognizably modern, but something in between a living trial run for shapes and systems that would dominate later eras. And to understand how this odd creature functioned from day to day, you have to place it back in the swampy world it inhabited, where heat predators and constant danger shaped every move it made. Picture a rhinoceros-sized creature sitting chest deep in a slow, swampy channel, its heavy skull rising above the waterline, while insects buzzed overhead and shadows of predators shifted on the banks. This was the world of mid-Permian Russia, where the humid floodplains of the Perm region supported tangles of vegetation and broad wetlands in the midst of a supercontinent otherwise scorched by extreme heat. These swamp corridors were lifelines in a land often hostile to life, providing shade, food, and cover for animals like Estomenosuchus. But the same thickets also hid danger predators powerful enough to strike even at something so massive. The best known of these threats was Eot Titanosuchus, a carnivorous therapsid with a skull longer than most human torsos. Although Estemonosuchus outweighed many carnivores, sheer size didn't guarantee safety in an ecosystem where surprise and agility could topple the unprepared. A creature that spent its days grazing in the shallows had to remain constantly aware of shapes moving through reeds or ripples that didn't belong. This tension defined its existence. The gift of bulk and defensive anatomy allowed it to thrive, but at the cost of living always on edge. Its physical design reflected a semi-aquatic rhythm. The sprawling forelimbs helped it crouch low, lowering that wide skull into patches of ferns and other low vegetation along the banks. The hind limbs set more vertically ensured it could push forward with enough strength to heave itself out of, of muddy shallows when needed. 
Combined with its barrel chest and massive frame, this build was ideal for hours spent half submerged grazing in slow water where plants grew thick. In many ways, its life pattern resembled that of a modern hippopotamus, an animal that avoids overheating and predators alike by keeping most of its body hidden beneath the surface during the day. Its crown of bone wasn't simply excess weight. Imagine murky water and dim light filtering through heavy Permian air. In such poor visibility, those antler-like horns rising from a broad skull could have signaled identity to others at a distance. They may also have been warnings, an enormous spiked outline rising from the swamp said more than aggression ever needed to. For rivals within the species, these projections could have doubled as sparring tools, letting males clash head to head in clear ritualized combat rather than risking fatal bites. For predators creeping too close, a display of horns coupled with a sudden lunge of ton heavy body mass could have been enough to turn attack into retreat. Spending so much time in water offered another benefit body temperature control. In the hostile Permian climate, where arid interiors could bake under temperatures beyond 70 degrees, cooler swamp edges provided a refuge. By remaining semi-submerged while feeding, Estamena sutures conserved energy, avoided overheating, and masked much of its profile from carnivores. That balance of concealment and intimidation gave this horned swamp giant a place in an ecosystem brimming with risk. When you bring all these factors together, Estamenosuchus appears not as a clumsy oddball, but as a specialized wetland dweller. It's life shaped by constant threats and the need to manage heat predators and rivals in equal measure. And while its lifestyle seems well suited to its setting, the real puzzle begins when you examine its teeth because they hint at a diet far more complicated than its environment alone suggests. Sharp canine fangs in the front, flat grinding teeth in the back. What kind of diet does that combination reveal? When paleontologists first studied the mouth of Estaminosuchus, they quickly realized it broke expectations. Predators usually have long pointed teeth across their entire jaws designed for cutting flesh, while true herbivores carry rows of flat, blocky teeth for shearing leaves and pulping tough stems. Yet here was a mid-sized giant with both. Its curved canines looked ready for stabbing, but its smaller back teeth had more in common with browsing animals that crush and grind vegetation. The question became clear, was Estamenosuchus a meat eater in disguise, a plant browsing brute with intimidating ornamentation or something flexible enough to take? Both the paradox has fueled debate for decades. On one hand, the forward fangs suggest an animal capable of puncturing hide, a trait many linked to predatory behavior. On the other hand, the animal's barrel-shaped body and grazing posture fit more comfortably with the lifestyle of a dedicated browser. Many researchers proposed that the fangs were not primarily feeding tools at all, but weapons for contest. They could have been used in jaw-locking fights between males or as defensive spikes to ward off predators that tested their luck in swamp margins. That interpretation would tilt its diet toward plants with the enormous canines serving a visual function rather than a dietary one. Its limb structure gives further support to the browsing idea. The hind legs were placed neatly under the body, a configuration that favors steady walking and supports long sessions of foraging. The forelegs still sprawled outward would have allowed it to lower its head without difficulty keeping the jaw aligned with vegetation close to the ground or floating in shallow waters. This combination of limb postures makes sense in the context of a plant-eating animal, especially one adapted to feed for long hours in hot floodplains where efficiency mattered. By contrast, an active predator benefits from longer, straighter legs on both ends capable of rapid acceleration. Estaminosuchus lacked that athletic build, yet the case is not closed. Some paleontologists argue that despite its plant-dominated meals, it likely did not refuse carrion or small animal prey when given the chance. Large size comes with high energy demands, and in the unpredictable Permian climate, it may have paid to accept whatever food the environment offered. A scattered carcass along the banks of a river or soft-bodied amphibians within reach may have been easy supplements. This line of thought supports an omnivorous lifestyle where meat was opportunistic rather than central. The challenge is that fossil bones preserve form, but not behavior. We recognize the tools, it had two types of teeth, a massive gut cavity and semi-aquatic adaptations, but no last meal is frozen in stone to tell us exactly what went down its throat. 
That uncertainty has left the debate unresolved, emphasizing how difficult it is to reconstruct diets from incomplete clues. Still, this puzzle highlights a bigger truth. The Permian world was full of experiments. Estaminosuchus mixing features that seem contradictory shows that feeding strategies were not set in neat categories. It represents a laboratory of possibilities where evolution tried out hybrids of carnivore and herbivore design on a scale large enough to reshape ecosystems. Regardless of which side of the debate proves right, its end came not from dietary failure or competition, but from a catastrophic event that swept entire lineages from the swamps forever. Estemenosuchus was a strange experiment in evolution, part reptile-like, part mammal-like, a crowned swamp giant that carried features from both worlds. Its head was a fortress of bone, its body weighted with bulk, and its skin held hints of a future only mammals would complete. Yet even such a distinctive creature could not escape extinction. 